You may be seated. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. God's so good, isn't he? Amen. Isn't it good to serve the Lord? Amen. I said, isn't it good to serve the Lord? Amen. Amen. I like to hear that enthusiasm Amen. answering a Amen. question like that. Well, it is good to be in Pekin. I, sp I did spend a lot of years here, and uh, they were good years. I remember um, so well when when I came. It was it was just uh, I, I don't know. I was in a place where uh, I, I had uh, received a, a call from our district superintendent, and he said, "I want to ask you something, and and uh, don't say no until you prayed about it." And uh, he said, uh, "There's a church that's open." I was pastoring in Wood River uh, in the Alton area, and uh, he said, there's a church that's open, and I just got a feeling in my spirit about it, and it's in Pekin, uh, Illinois, and I want you to pray about it. Don't answer me until you prayed about it. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And uh, my, my mother and family lived up in, um, in the Rock Island area, so uh, we made a trip up to visit them, and on the way we swung by here, and the church was on that triangle by the post office downtown. And uh, I drove by that, and we were in a brand new building in Wood River, and uh, had a congregation about twice the size of the one here, and um, the, the fellowship hall, or whatever it was, for the church here was uh, an old house that was right next door to the church building. And it was built in the 1980s. And it looked like it. Uh, it was in bad shape. And uh, I, you know, I prayed about it. And I, I don't know if I've ever prayed on a decision as long because everything in the natural realm just didn't look like something that I, that I wanted to do. But uh, the more I prayed, I finally uh, called up and said, uh, I'll go ahead and go and preach there if you want. We'll pray about it and see what God does. And, and uh, so I, I did, and, and uh, I was uh, elected or voted in to be the pastor. And I said, you know, I still don't have an answer from God, gentlemen. And uh, let me just pray about it. And as soon as I get an answer from God, uh, I'll let you know. So uh, we went to the hotel. Um, something Springs, is that still here? Mineral Springs. Mineral Springs, is that still here? Uh, that's where they put us up. And uh, we had the kids with us, and uh, we, we crawled in bed, and we laid there, and, and uh, we got talking about it. And all of a sudden, this peace came over me, and I knew that I knew. So I called uh, the deacon up, and I said, uh, we, we just feel that it is God's will for us. So the rest of the night, for several hours, we just laid there in bed and made jokes. Uh, where, uh, you know, can you tell where you're, where you're pastoring and where you're at? No, but we're peeking to try to find out where it is. <laughs> and I mean, we made a, all the kind of joke we could about peeking, uh, trying to peek to find out, you know, and so on. But uh, we moved in and immediately God just started to bless in the church. And uh, we saw people come in and uh, some here tonight came in. Uh, in the ministry there, so we just rejoice in that, and I just, I don't have a doubt in my heart, a doubt in my mind that God has peak and set for a revival, and uh, I believe Pastor Mike has that on his heart, I believe that he has a vision for it, and I believe that God will mightily use you uh, and him in this revival. And hasn't this been an interesting year? <laughs> Amen. I think it was last night I mentioned that I was so glad when 2019 was over, and now I'd gladly go back, except then I'd have to go through 2020 again, and uh, I'm going to be glad to get out of this one. But you know, uh, we just kept pre keep pressing in and believing God, and things are going to just keep getting better and better yeah. for us. Amen. I don't know what's going to happen in the world. Uh, we've got an election coming up, and I'm believing uh, with all my heart that it's going to be right. And uh, I believe that God has a man prepared, and I believe that it's definitely in God's direction, God's will, and I'm trusting that the United States will, uh, will back up God's plan. 
And uh, if it does or it doesn't, we're going on. Amen. If it does or it doesn't, God's going to bring revival to us. Yes. And uh, we're, that's, that's what's important. We're all on a journey. And uh, it's important to understand that you're on a journey. You, you're not just a, a person alone, but you're with a lot of other believers that all of us are, are on journeys. Amen. And uh, our journey is a journey to uh, heaven, to eternity. It's a journey to find God's perfect will in our lives and to live in it and to do it. Yes. We're, on, we're on a trip. Um, uh, he, Pastor was talking about uh, Pastor Bob being in, in Hawaii. You know, you, wh wherever you go in a trip, you're usually going to find somebody who's been there. And they're going to suggest to you, well, listen, when you go, uh, go there and see this. Go to this restaurant and that restaurant and uh, make sure that you do that. Uh, we we went, uh, Debbie and I have been married uh, 13 years now. Uh, Bonnie went to be with the Lord 17 years ago, and uh, I, I figured I was single for the rest of my life, and then God just brought perfect lady to come into my life, and so we went to, uh, we went to Hawaii on, on vacation. And um, there's, a, there's a volcano that's not active anymore, along Waikiki Beach called uh, Diamond Head. <clears throat> well, um, Debbie kept saying, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to go climb Diamond Head. I'd like to go walk up that, hike up that. And finally, uh, happy, wife, happy wife, happy life. And I said, all right, all right, we'll, we'll do it. So we hiked all the way from our hotel to Diamond Head, and then uh, uh, almost a mile high, not quite, and we, we marched up. Diamond Head. Now, the last part of Diamond Head is 175 stair steps. And uh, so I'm going up step after step after step and step after step. And we finally get up to the top of it and, and uh, we look around and she said, wasn't this worth it? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, let me tell you that uh, you're wasting your time if you're trying to kill me because I don't have any insurance. <laughs> so I, just, I needed to back off. But you know, when, when, you, when you do things, if they'd had a taxi up there, I'd take it a taxi from the top of anyway. <laughs> but uh, when you go on a trip, you like to know somebody that's been on it. And even if, even if they, what they did didn't turn out right, if they did the wrong thing, to know that keeps you from doing the same thing. They say, oh, hey, there, you'll hear a lot of people talking about uh, staying in this hotel. Don't stay there. It's dirty. Or uh, don't eat in this restaurant. It, it's not good food. Well, then you stay away because you, you, you take a, a tip from them having made that trip. And I believe that as we look in the Word of God, and especially as we look at the children of Israel, we can find out things that they did on their journey. When they left Egypt and were going to the Promised Land, we can find out things that they did on their journey that ruined the journey for them and as a matter of fact, kept them from getting to their destination. Amen. Now, hopefully everybody in here, if you're born again, you have a destination in mind. Uh, pastor's talking about revival. That was on my heart, still is on my heart. Uh, those of you that attended uh, when I was pastor here, uh, probably you remember that one of my favorite scriptures in the word was that I may know him the power of his resurrection and so on uh, that was and that's still my passion to know him more well if we're going to know him and if we're going to see victory in our lives and we're going to see answers to prayer and we're going to be overcomers then we need to look and see what the children of Israel did that are tips to us and the truth of the matter is <coughs> If we study Moses, we get one direction, but when we study the children of Israel, it's all about don't do this. Amen. This is what you don't do because they continually failed before God and they ended up, instead of getting to where they wanted to go to their destination, they died in the wilderness Amen. and stayed there for 40 years. So um, when, when we look at this situation of the children of Israel, God brought them out with every promise. You remember, uh, they had the Passover night. 
That Passover night was one of the most dynamic things that's ever happened in history. You, you've got to understand that out of the children of Israel, there were uh, anywhere, the estimations vary, anywhere from two to uh, four, five, six million Israelites that came out of that land. Now that's a crowd. And uh, they all journeyed together. They all came out together. And when they came out, Passover night was such a powerful night. And uh, I'm not preaching on the blood of Jesus tonight, but that blood applied over the doorpost didn't just affect them that night while they were in the house. That affected them when they came out of the house because the blood covering over that home, over that family, was over them as they journeyed through the wilderness. Now, um, I, I don't know what the current... Well, let me just use the Lexington area where I, where I live. Uh, in the Lexington area, we have, a, 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 in the greater area, probably about 750,000 population. Now, it's maybe grown to more than that by now. We have at least five major hospitals that are full all the time. And uh, out of 750,000, the Bible says that when the children of Israel came out of, of the land of Egypt, there was not one feeble one among them. Yes. They were young. They were old. They had been slaves all of their lives. They had, you know that they had been punished and beaten and so on. And all of those things, but there was not one sick, feeble one among them. And they had all the wealth of the land of Egypt was in their possession as they came out. Now that's a powerful thing. But it, we, we can see how when you and I got born again, we came to Jesus. And we started our journey toward heaven and toward the blessings of God. Everything was provided for us under the blood of Jesus that was provided for them over the, by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Wealth and riches and health were provided. When I think about as many as three million people coming out of that land, Passover night was one of the greatest miracle nights ever. Amen. When anybody and everybody that was sick was healed. And the next day they went out and gathered up the wealth of the land and started a journey to the promised land and to the promises of God. Now once the children of Israel uh, came out, there's a there's a 40 year journey ahead of them. Is that what it's supposed to be? Absolutely not. That wasn't what God wanted. Amen. The journey from Egypt to the promised land would have taken them only the matter of a few weeks. Had they believed God, had they trusted God, and all of the promises that they received in the promised land, or in Egypt rather, on the Passover night, all of the blessings, all the promises of God were of no avail to them. The Bible says in Hebrews that the word profited them nothing. Why was it? Because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. So we can have the promises of God for healing. We can have the promises of God for a prosperous journey. We can have the promises of God for wealth and riches to be in our lives. But if we don't expect it and believe it, then it's not going to do us any good either. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. <laughs> Somebody amen him, may I? I? You know amens are like sick him to a bulldog, to a preacher, right? So, uh, but but we, we need to understand that. God's given you promises to walk in divine health. Yes. God's given you promises to have wealth and riches in your life. Yes. And most Christians don't even believe for those things, let alone press in to have them. And the promises of the word affect us or profit us nothing if they're not mixed with faith in them that hear it. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This is a Siva. Siva means pause and think about that. And, and we need to understand that this is truth. So, let's, uh, we, we want tonight, I, I want us to look at their record, at the mistakes they made. Because if we can see the mistakes they made that ca caused them to fail in their journey, then we can realize, I can't make those mistakes. Amen. 
If I'm going to win in my walk with God, if I'm going to win in getting to the place that I want to be in the Lord, these are mistakes that I can't make because they brought, they brought destruction and loss to the children of Israel. So we look at, at, at their, uh, their journey and see they made some major, major mistakes. Uh, many times the best teachers experience, but I prefer it when it's somebody else's experience. Don't you? Amen. Amen. When somebody else has the experience, then we can look at them and say, uh, I, I can see where, where I don't want to do that because I see what happened with them. Yes. I see what they did wrong. You know, when you're, when you're in ministry, it, it's always a good thing to be under another pastor for a time in ministry. You know, like an assistant pastor, a youth pastor, or whatever, where you can get training under that pastor. Well, I never did that. But I was an evangelist before I became a pastor. And so I learned a lot about ministry by just the pastors that I would go to to hold meetings. And you know what I learned the most? The thing I learned the most was things not to do. I saw jealous pastors. I saw pastors that, uh, that ruled with an iron fist. I saw pastors that didn't have a heart for their people. I saw pastors that would sit around the table and talk bad about the members of their congregation, etc. And I learned things by, by just being with those pastors that I knew I never wanted that in my ministry, never wanted to go there, never wanted to be that. Amen. And that's, that's, we've got to learn. And if we can learn by somebody else's mistakes, it sure will help us. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, start to read at verse number 8. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 8. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God's so good, isn't he? Amen. I, um, I just think you need, to, uh, you need to laugh a little bit or something. i got to get you into this. So let me, let me read you this. This is just an interesting thing. You love, you love music, right? A bagpiper. Uh, and, and I don't know who invented the bagpipes, but it wasn't inspired to God. I'm sure of that. Uh, but a bagpiper who plays many gigs was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in the Kentucky back county. Now, as the bagpiper was not familiar with the backwoods, uh, he got lost. Being a typical man, typical man, he didn't stop for directions. He finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only diggers and crew left and they were eating lunch. He felt badly and he apologized to the man for being late. He went to the side of the grave and looked down and the vault lid was already in place. Not knowing what else to do, he started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. He played out his heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. He played like he'd never played before for the homeless man. And as he played amazing grace, the workers began to weep. They wept, he wept. They all wept together. When he finished, he packed up, packed up his bagpipes and started for his car. Though his head hung low, his heart was full. As he opened the door to his car, he heard one of the workers say, I ain't never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So anyway, tips for the trip. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 8. Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation in the land or in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years. Notice that. God said they tempted him. What does it mean they tempted God? How can you tempt God? I, I think if we could put it in literal language, there were a number of times that God said, don't tempt me. Amen. They said, we're going to die out here in this wilderness. Don't tempt me. <laughs> we're going to starve to death. Don't tempt me. 
and they tempted God for 40 years. And, and, and uh, they saw God's works. It didn't matter that they had seen the ten plagues. That's an amazing thing. Amen. Ten plagues came to Egypt and did not come to the land of Goshen where they lived. You know, that's, that's where I've stood. That's what I preached in Lexington in our church concerning COVID. The, the plague would come right up to the border of the land of Goshen and couldn't go any further. Whether it was flies, it's like there's an invisible wall. They fly up to that invisible wall. That's the land of Goshen. That's where the people of God are. And so the flies would just go on and, and they couldn't. Frogs right up to the border. Uh, the, the, the sleet and snow, uh, not snow, but rain and thunder and all of it. They were protected. Beloved, we live in the land of Goshen. Amen. We're the children of the Most High God. Yes. And God puts a protection over our lives. Yes. And the children of Israel had seen one after another after another uh, as those plagues came and didn't touch them. And yet the first thing they do when they're out of Egypt and come to the Red Sea is they start making serious mistakes and tempting God. So uh, he said in verse number 10, Wherefore, because of that, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. What they did on their trip to the promised land caused God to say they will never enter the promised land. So let's look at some of their errors. I think the number one error, and it's funny how we never do these. And uh, we never do them because we, we've become so accustomed, we don't even realize we're doing them. That's why when I first started understanding how faith works and how you have to watch out for what you say, we, we always work together on that. And you gotta do it carefully. Husbands and wives should work together. Now make an agreement. Because you don't want to fight for three days because you corrected them. But I like to do something like this. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. When I heard that, it just made me sick. And my response is, well, I'm going to agree with you for that sickness if you want me to. Um, amen. Hallelujah. Did I get to the right church? Is, am I, in the right place? I see familiar faces out there, but the, the, the silence is deafening. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we don't control what we say. And, and we use expressions like, it made me sick. Uh, that's a terrible thing to say about yourself. Right. It didn't make you sick. Uh, but, but, but we get into that. And, and we don't even realize some of the negative things that we say. Amen. The first thing that I see is that the children of Israel, the first mistake they made, and they made it all the way through their 40 years, was complaining and murmuring. Every time they came up against a battle, they complained and murmured. Amen. And murmuring, uh, murmuring is just like this. Hey, Johnny, uh, take out the garbage. Why do you have to take out the garbage? You always have to take out the garbage. It's not my turn to take out the garbage. Why didn't Dad do it once and then take his? Uh, that's murmuring. Amen. And the children of Israel did this all the time. Yes. Uh, they, they'd come to a place where uh, they're out in a desert and they got no food. And they say, why did God bring us out here? He brought us out here just to die. He's going to starve us to death. we got nothing to eat. What are we going to do? God said, don't tempt me. <laughs> you know, because that's what they're doing. And we can do the same kind of thing. Yes. Listen, beloved, battles come. Yes. Tests come. We can complain all we want about the COVID. But it ain't going nowhere. And our complaining doesn't help anything. God doesn't like the murmuring and complaining out of his people. Amen. Oh, I tell you what, this just isn't going right. I don't know what's going on. Listen, let's go uh, to Numbers chapter 14, verse number 26. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 26. Well, I, I'm telling you what, if we, if we could just have somebody record for us the complaining we do sometimes. I, I tell you what, they're they're doing this at my job, and they're doing, and, and I I don't know why I can't. 
and you just go on and on with complaints and murmuring. God doesn't like the murmuring and the complaining. Amen. You say, you mean to tell me that God's all right with COVID? No, I don't believe God's all right with COVID, but neither do I believe that he's all right with you complaining about it when he's promised you that no plague shall come nigh your dwelling. And then you complain about this thing that's going around like it's sure to get you and you're going to die of it. The Bible says no plague comes out of your dwelling. I said last night, I'm trying to wear out Psalms 91. I, I confess that over me. I confess it over uh, Debbie and me. Believing God, no plague comes nigh our dwelling. And it doesn't matter what the plague is. It could be coronavirus or whatever, but no plague comes nigh our dwelling. Numbers chapter 14, verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Why is there any food? Now look, what it, most of the time when you read it, they didn't talk about God. They did at times. Who did they talk about? Moses. Moses led us out here. Moses got us into this. Yes. And they complained about Moses. But God said they were complaining about him. They murmur against me. Look at verse 28. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. I, I don't know if you mark your Bible, underline in your Bible or whatever, but if you do, uh, underline that phrase there, starting as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do. And that's what we believe about faith. You keep saying it, and that's what you're going to have. Yes. And that's what God is saying here. You keep talking like this, that's exactly what you're going to get. Amen. And every time you said it, you're just securing it more and more that that's what I will do. The Bible tells us what you say with your mouth, believe Amen. in your heart, that's what you're going to have. Amen. So when you're complaining, you're believing God for just the opposite. I, um, I, I was just thinking about when I pastored here in Pekin, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name, Clawson was uh, the couple's name, uh, last name, I, I can't remember his first name right now. Ryan. What is it? Ryan and Cheryl Okay. Uh, Brian, you say? Ron. Ron. Yeah, that's right. That sounds right. Ron Claus. Now, how could I forget Ron? <laughs> uh, anyway, he came to me one time and he said, Pastor Callahan, uh, I just got laid off. They're laying off people. You know that does happen around this Capitol area, right? Where uh, all of a sudden everybody's getting laid off for some reason or another. He said, I just got laid off. And uh, uh, I, 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 I don't have a job. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I said, Ron, let's do this. Let's believe that God is using this to give you a promotion. And that this is one of the steps in the promotion of a new job that God has for you. Let's just believe that. Then uh, uh, instead of saying, I don't have a job, you do have a job. Your job is to find a job. And to believe God that he's going to give you a job that is a promotion for you. And he said, okay, I can do that. So that we prayed together and he started believing. It wasn't, it wasn't very long at all. He came to me and he said, I found the job. And he said, uh, this is the best job I've ever had. He said, I'm starting out. I think he started out pretty close to where he was. But he said, I, I'll get advancements regularly along the way. And, and that's exactly what happened. And instead of complaining, he believed God that this was a step that God was bringing him to on the way to his victory. Yes. Uh, you, you know, sometimes we, uh, like you're, you get a flat tire and you just, this isn't what I wanted and I got a flat tire and I, 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 I'm on my way to, you, you know, you don't, the Bible says in everything give thanks. Amen. You don't get out and say, well, thank God I got a flat tire. That's a really neat flat tire. That's really flat. That's not what he's talking about. But that flat tire could have kept you from getting an accident someplace down the line. Uh, there were people on 911 who had things come up to keep them from getting to work that day. 
uh, just abnormal things. And it kept them from getting to work that day. And they would have been in the towers, would have lost their lives. But some, So don't complain about the problems. Don't complain about the things that come along. Just begin to thank God and praise God and stand on the word of God yes. for what God said he will do yes. uh, through, through this. Now, I, I don't want God to talk this way about me. But I'm going to read here in just a minute. I don't want when it when it comes to day, if Jesus doesn't come first, when it comes to day that my uh, life is over, I, I wouldn't want God to say, just put his carcass wherever you want. <laughs> Would that seem like a kind of a disparaging way for God to talk about you? That God would just call your body a carcass? But listen, verse number 29. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. And all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Your carcasses are going to fall dead out here in the wilderness. Why? Because you're going to get what you said in your complaining. Yeah. Uh, that this is more important than what you're getting. Amen. Amen. Say, how do you know I'm really getting it? Well, you, we we got to get it even more. Amen. you got to understand, this murmuring and complaining, it doesn't work. That's right. Doubtless, uh, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell there. Go over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10. Hallelujah. God says to the children, uh, to the Christians in Corinth, he says, neither murmur you as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, who is the destroyer? Is the destroyer God? No, it's the enemy. Mm -hmm. Murmuring puts you into Satan's hands. Murmuring opens the door for the enemy to get after you. Amen. After your finances, after your life, after your health. Murmuring opens the door for the enemy. And that's what he said. They were destroyed of the destroyer, of the devil. And all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We at the end of the age. These are examples to us. So we can understand that on this journey to the promises of God and on this journey to eternal life, we don't murmur and complain. Amen. Uh, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You don't have a battle come to you that isn't uh, that, that others are not going through. <coughs> Other people go through those battles. I had a woman uh, call me and set up a counseling appointment. And Pastor Bob wasn't close, so I had to take it. <laughs> I don't like counseling uh, because people don't do what you tell them to do anyway. And they come and take up your time. And, and I don't mind giving them the time if they do what I tell them. I can help anybody if they'll do what I tell them uh, because I'll tell them what the Word says. But she came in and she, she, uh, she's got a second marriage and um, the husband's son, who is an adult, lives in the house with them. And he will not clean up his room. He will not take any responsibility. And her husband won't make him do anything. So she said, I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I don't know how much more stress I can handle with this thing. So I listened to her for a while. And then I said, you know that if we could find out, if there's any way for us to do a search, we would find out that there are thousands of other women in this world today who are going through that same thing and they're not ready to have a nervous breakdown. It isn't the battle you're going through, it's how you're going through it. It isn't what your circumstance is, it's how you're looking at your circumstance. And if there's nothing you can do about it, then get in the front, make it look like a prey and you're leading it. Because you can't change it. You're knowing you can't change it. Yeah. You have to just change you. Change your attitude. Yes. And, and uh, just ask the Lord to help you to love Him. while you clean up after Him. Amen. She said, okay. 
And I have no idea if she ever did that or not. But, but I gave her good advice, right? Because that's the way, that's the way. So he says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that you are able. I got to talk to you about that verse. Christians love that verse. You know, they, they, they say, oh, I, I don't know how I can handle anymore, but God says he won't allow me to be tempted above what I'm able. This isn't talking about you walking it out and you're complaining, murmuring, and flesh. This is talking about the fact that whatever battle you are in, God has given us provision to have victory in that battle. He, it, with the temptation, with that battle, he's made a way so that you can walk in that way and see victory no matter how bad the battle might be or how bad the battle may seem. Are, are you seeing that? Yeah. It isn't like God is saying, okay, that's all he can stand, but don't, 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 no more battles to him, not until he gets over these. That's, that's not it. When the battle comes, there's an answer for us. Yes. That's what the Beatitudes were all about. The Beatitudes are, blessed are you when you go through this. And, and I'm just going to paraphrase what the structure of it is all about. You're happy when you go through this because there's an answer in Christ. Amen. And that's, that's what it's all about. So, uh, he will with the temptation also make a way of escape so that you're able to bear it. But even, even when things were going good, they complained. And that's, that's the way complainers do. Amen. Numbers chapter 11 and verse number 4. Numbers chapter 11 and verse number 4. Okay, they're out in the wilderness. They're getting manna every day. So they got food to eat. And I have an idea that they didn't have to take supplements. <laughs> I have an idea that, that that manna that God sent down had, had every vitamin and mineral and nutrient in it that they needed. Amen. And so uh, God rained that down. It said, and, and, and they had water. And I have an idea they didn't have to get bottled water because the water God gave them was pure. <laughs> Amen. But listen to what it says. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? All they were eating was manna. Manna in the morning, manna in the evening, manna at dinner time. I mean, manna all day long. That was all they had to eat. They served fried manna, boiled manna, manna on a stick. I mean, they, any way you could figure to make manna, they were, but it was just manna every day. That's all they had to eat. So um, they said, verse number five, Listen, listen to the listen to the diet they had. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. Goodness, it sounds like a Hungarian ditch digger. I mean, <laughs> it's a, yeah. Can you imagine the breath on these guys? They were servants back in Egypt, but this is what they started. If, if I could just burp a little more garlic, I'd be happy right now. And, and they, were, they were lusting after the, the things that they used to eat. Hey, I just fell under conviction. I, I, I've been trying to eat low carb, and I, I complained a little bit about what I used to eat. Not that I ate it, but I want to eat it again. Isn't it funny how every, anything battered and fried is good? Yeah. The battered and fried ice cream. That's my favorite food group anyway, ice cream. I mean, I, and, and uh, Oreos and, and, and vegetables. You can't get a kid to eat your vegetables. Amen. <laughs> but he, but they, he's, they said, but now our soul is dried up. There's nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. The manna was what God was giving them to eat. Yes. And they were complaining about the manna. They had food, they had water, they had provision. But they were complaining even when things were going well. Now, the second thing, um, I, I'll try not to spend as long on, on the rest of these, but the second thing was fear. They would fall into fear. 
fear constantly. And fear is a major enemy for the believer. Yes. Because you can't be a believer and be in fear. So Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 13. Hallelujah. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Now you know what's going on here, don't you? When he writes this, the children of Israel, they come out of Egypt, they came to the Red Sea. They got mountains on one side. The, uh, the uh, Egyptian military is after them with their chariots blazing. And uh, I mean, they're, they're coming full steam after them. And ahead of them is the Red Sea. There's no way out of this. How could God deliver us out of this? How could God do that? You know, I've been praying that about the election. How can God do this? Because we need God to intervene in this. Yeah. But God has ways to do things that we have never thought of or dreamed of. And the children of Israel certainly hadn't thought of it or dreamed of it. They stood there looking at the Red Sea. They can't. Two, three million people with their children they can, and their goods, their cattle. They can't swim across that sea. They have no idea how God can do it. So they're standing there in fear. You may not be able to figure out how God can meet your need, but don't get into fear over it. Get into faith over it, knowing that God is able to do it exceeding abundantly above and beyond all you could even ask or think. God is not limited in what He can do to bring you into victory. Amen. Well, uh, you, you know, I'm going through this, this pain and I've got this wrong in my body. And what can God do about that? God, God, God can put a new one in there. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it when God does that too. Yeah. I don't know how many people I have seen healed where God put new hearts in them. And, and that's exactly what their testimony was. I've even called it out at times in word of knowledge. God is putting a new heart in somebody. We had a guy visiting our church. I didn't even know uh, where he was from. Uh, it was some someplace, uh, North Carolina, someplace out there, and he was visiting family, came to our church, and the Lord spoke to me that. He said, there's somebody here that I'm giving them a new heart. I called it out, and this man received that. I talked to him months later, and he said, when you called that out, I received a brand new heart. I've, I, I've been to the doctor. They can't believe it. I've had no more. God can do anything. Yeah. You don't have to get in fear over it. You don't have a problem that, you do, that you'll fail to have a promise for. Right. God is able to do it. Yes. So don't let yourself get in fear. So what did God do? Bible says God blew his nose. <laughs> have you read it? He had the breath, the breath out of his nostrils. And the sea opened up. And they walked through on dry ground to the other side. What well, that's that's not possible, right? It's not in the natural. But with God, nothing is impossible. And then in the New Testament, God added even more to that, and he said, with us, nothing is impossible to those that believe. Faith goes this direction, fear goes the total opposite, it goes in that direction. Fear is faith in failure. Let me say that again. Fear is faith in failure. All right. Let's say that you have a, a physical need and you get into fear over it. Why are you in fear? Because you are afraid that you're not going to get over it. You're afraid that you're going to die with it. You're afraid that it will render you incapable, whatever. And when you're in that fear, you can't be in God's fear. Amen? Much of the complaining and murmuring that we're talking about comes from fear. So you've got to resist fear. Speak to it, command it to leave, and replace it with the word of God and praise. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we know the conclusion that Job gave concerning all the problems Job went through. 
Job 3.25 For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Did God do those things to Job? Did God kill his children? No. Did God burn down his property? No. Did God have his cattle stolen? No. What did? Job is fear. He said, the thing I greatly feared, he feared his children dying. I, I'm sure I preached this here uh, in, in Pekin that uh, Job was a, a, a marvelous man of God. Well, we know that's true. But one of the signs of that marvelous man of God is he got up every morning to make sacrifices and pray for his children. Yes. And little did I understand then that he was doing that out of fear. He got up every day, and it's like, I have no idea what they're doing over there. I have no idea what's going on, but, but I'm going to make sacrifices so that they're right with God. So every, I, I, And he did it out of fear. It says everything that happened to him there came because what he greatly feared came upon him. What's that let you know? You don't dare let fear control you. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of faith. Amen? Amen? And you just have to thank God and rejoice in Him. Um, I used to really have a problem with one of the uh, scriptures there in Job in the King James translation where it says that, um, that the devil came up and said, and, and God said to him, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. And I thought, you know, if that's what happens, if God brags on you, I just soon that kind of go under the under the radar and not have him notice me that much because if God says have you noticed how good he's doing and the devil says well let me at him okay go ahead I don't want that kind of recognition but original original Hebrew should be read something like this God said are you are you aimed at my servant Job have you come to get at my servant Job because Job had a hedge about him, but he made a hole in his hedge by fear. Amen. Amen. Meditate on that a while because it's, it's, it's accurate. Here's, a, here's the third thing they made a mistake on, on their journey, and that's forgetfulness. It's so easy sometimes to forget what God's already done. If you're honest about it, and you remember, the, you remember what you did, um, I know, I, I know I've done this. Just get in the middle of a really, really, really bad battle. And you think, I just got to praise the Lord. I just, I just got to praise the Lord. I just, I just got to praise the Lord. And your thoughts are, about what? <laughs> I can't think of anything to praise Him about. Because we have a tendency to be forgetful in the time of need. And, and, and you can start out with the simplest of simple things and just thank Him. Jesus, remember when they came back, they went sent out on evangelism two by two, and they came back and they were rejoicing because demons were being cast out. And, and so and He said, don't rejoice so much over demons being cast out, but rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you can't think of anything else at the moment, just start thanking Him for that, that you're born again, that he's taken away your sins and you have eternal life. But it seems to be a habit when we're born into this natural world, it seems to be a habit to forget past victories in battles that we've gone through. I've had God heal me of so many things. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm 78 and I, I don't feel like 78. Uh, and the Lord just impressed on me recently to say it different. I'm only 78. When, when I'm 110, I'm going to look back at 78 and remember that's all I was back there was 78. <laughs> it's all relative. We get it in our minds and, and they're proving in, in the laboratories, they're proving that what you think gives instruction and direction to every cell in your body. When you think you're getting old, your body is notified that you're getting old. And you start accepting pains and aches and sickness and disease because you're old. And what happens when you start doing that? You get all that stuff. So you don't get into fear. 
You don't get into it. Amen. Amen. And, and you don't get forgetful about all that God has done. Let's go to some scriptures here. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. <clears throat> Take heed therefore, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So we see that when they could not, we see that, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. God wanted them into the promised land, but they couldn't enter in because of unbelief. Go over to chapter 4 and verse number 1 of Hebrews. Let us therefore fear. And we get our word phobia from that Greek word. That kind of, we have a phobia about, about a certain thing. Lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now let me explain that. We've got, we got all of these promises of God. I mean the promises of God are stacked high. And we should have a phobia that I'm not, I, I, I don't want to miss out on one of them. Any of these promises that God has for us, I want every one of them in my life. I don't want to come short in any of them. I want every one of them uh, to be in my life. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, children of Israel in the wilderness. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Phobias. Fear. You know that uh, there's a lot of Fear of negative things. I remember uh, when I was when I lived here, and I had that morning devotional time every morning at Good Morning America, and uh, we we would take a, a piece of news that you never hear about because it's a little weird, and uh, I'd have one minute where I tell it, and then I tell about I I would associate that with something out of the Word, and we did this one on phobias. And, the, I mean, there are so many phobias. My favorite one was acrobatophobia. And uh, that's the fear of getting peanut butter stuck on the roof of your mouth. <laughs> People with acrobatophobia will not eat peanut butter. They're afraid it'll choke them to death. And so, they, so you can have all kinds of fears, but there's a fear... Uh, that this is telling us that that we're to have a, that kind of a concern. I'm not letting one of these promises go. That's a promise for me. I'm I'm hanging on to that. I'm pressing into it. I I don't like heights. I hate to use the word fear, but I don't like heights. Now I could get over it, but I don't need to. I as long as you know I have heights in an airplane, that's fine. I'm in an airplane, so, but to walk over to the edge of a building and look down, not this guy. Uh -uh. Now, like I said, I couldn't get over it. We're, we've been to Mexico City a number of times, and uh, we went to Mexico City one of our trips, and uh, one of the pastors said, would you like to see the pyramids? I thought, those are in Egypt. But, but they have pyramids in Mexico, and in, uh, right outside of Mexico City. And what it, what it was, they, uh, it was in, in worship of their heathen gods. And on these pyramids, uh, according to the level of the god, was the height of the pyramid. And there were uh, some of the first pyramids that you'd see as you came there. Uh, you could look across them and see over on the other side. And they would make human sacrifices on these pyramids. But then you go back a little bit further, and there's one that goes way up. And uh, people were up walking around on that. And we said, well, let's go up. So we walk up those steps, step after step, you know, and we get up to the top and we walk around. And I walked over to the back and they were excavating another one uh, just right behind there. And so we've been up there a little while. I walk over and I look and it's like it goes straight down. All of a sudden, those stairs were only this wide. <laughs> and I thought, I, I, I walked back to Pastor Jim and I said, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get down. No railing. There was a railing. I actually thought I might just sit down and, and go like that, step after step. <laughs> Jim said, if you'd have done that, I'd have run down those steps to film it. <laughs> so that, was, that was a big help. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. 
I got to get down, so I'm just going to hold onto your arm and let's go. He said, okay. So I took hold of his arm, and I think several days later he got circulation back. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but I took a hold of his arm, and we started to, But you know, I learned something. I learned that after one or two steps, I was okay. I didn't let go, but I was okay because I was focusing on the next step. It changed it when I got my eyes off of the long, uh, the long picture because those steps looked like it just went right straight down and it was several stories high. But, but anyway, I held on anyway. And I, and I got that. Well, we got, we got an arm to hold on to, don't we? Yeah. His unchanging hand. We hold on to God when we walk in the, in the battles. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14, verse 22. Amen. I, 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 I'm hurrying. We'll, we'll be done here pretty quick. Another couple hours. Just kidding. Numbers 14, 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have tempted me now, now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. They forgot all the miracles, all of the power of God, and complained and went in fear. All right, uh, the next one. God made them wealthy and they misused it. I, I, I'm not suggesting that when God makes you wealthy or brings increase to you that you have to turn it all over to God. God doesn't say that. You bring the tithe, the tenth. Uh, and, and besides that tenth, you sow seed. And that's just the way that it works. But here they come out of the land, and the Bible says they spoiled Egypt. They had all the wealth of Egypt. They took everybody's gold and silver and garments, and they had all of that. And what did they do with it? They made a golden calf. Do you know how much gold it would take to make a little golden idol of calf? And then, what was the excuse? Aaron said, we threw the gold in this fire and this calf came out. <laughs> that, that, was, that was unbelievable. So God brought them out of the land of Egypt with all the silver and gold, with all the wealth, but they misused it on a golden calf. God will bless you and increase you, but always keep God number one. Amen? Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy 6.17 Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. This is talking about people that are wealthy with worldly stuff. You know, like gold and silver and money or whatever. That they be not high-minded, not proud, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. When you put God first in your finances, God will bless you and increase what you have. Amen. That's just Bible. I practiced this in my life for years. I would no more think of not tithing than anything. And, and not only tithing, but sowing beyond that. Honoring God with the first fruit, with our, uh, with our finances. Amen. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let me just mention it. Money's not good. Money's not bad. What, what the, only, the only mark that's on money is who has it. If you have some cash in your pocket, you have no idea who's had that cash before. That's right. But now that it's in your pocket, if you're a tither, it's sanctified. It's set apart. Amen. Uh, let's look at number five. That uh, a tip for the trip that we thing we don't want to do is listen to negative reports. Is there anything that'll turn you backwards uh, quicker than listening to negative reports? Sometimes you've got to turn off the news. Amen. 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 Talking to me as much as I, to anybody else, because the news they don't focus on good news. Unless I mean you, you can get some that do, but they're very rare. And they'll tell you all the negative stuff. I, I, we're in a nation, we're in a world today of fear. Amen. 
fear over what they tell us about COVID. There is a, uh, there is a rate of people surviving and, and coming out of COVID uh, infection, infection at 99 point something percent. And yet they make you feel that if you ever get it, you're going to die with it. And they put fear. And there's anything worse than, uh, than getting a nation under fear. There's one of the prophets said he had a dream. And in the dream, uh, God showed him the devil's workbook. And the chapter it was open to was a chapter that said, he who teaches fear will rule the world. And we got to remember that. Fear puts us in a terrible position. And when we listen to the negative reports, and that's what they did, 10 spies came back. And what, what kind of report did those 10 spies have? Negative. And what, what did the people do? They listened to them and they wept all night long. And that, that finished it. God said, I've given you the land. And they, uh, their attitude was, if you've given us the land, then why are all them people in it? And some of them are giants. But he, he said, I've given you the land. All they had to do is go in and take it. And God would drive out the inhabitants thereof. And God said that. But they were in fear. They wept all night. It says in chapter 14 and verse number 1 of Numbers, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Let me wrap this up with this. Um, Exodus 15, 24 said, The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? They, they murmured because there was no bread. Exodus 16, 2. They murmured because they had no water. Exodus 17, 3. They murmured about uh, Mary and, and Aaron murmured against Moses because of his wife. Amen. Amen. Leave the pastor's wife alone. <laughs> when the evil report was given by the ten spies they murmured and uh, it, this ends uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to go into it but it ends with that judgment that came on Korah and, and all of those people and because they were murmuring about Moses and Aaron and uh, it, 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 caused, it caused the earth to open up and swallow them up. Amen. I mean, there were hundreds that died because of that. You can't please God and be murmuring and complaining and forgetting what God has done and living in fear. You can't. Amen. I love these words. There are some promises in a letter written long, long time ago. They're not getting older. They're getting better because he still wants us to know he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down, to let us down, let us down. He didn't lift us up to let us down. I read those promises in his letter and now I claim them for my own, filling my heart and making life better. And I just wanted you to know he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. Didn't build his home in us to move away. Didn't lift us up to let us down. He didn't lift us up to let us down. Yeah. God will get you through your journey to exactly where you want to go. If you'll walk with him, walk the word, and mix faith with the promises that God has given us in his word. Amen. 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 Let's stand together, shall we?